I used to have a weekly overnight babysitting job for a couple who frequently spent nights in another nearby city caring for one of their ailing parents. It was an easy gig because they only had one kid who was an eight-year-old and pretty independent. I just played with him for a few hours and got him ready for bed and then got paid for another 14 hours while I watched TV, raided their fridge, and slept on their couch. The one thing I hated about the job, however, was the house. It was a somewhat modern house in the country and they had big open windows and the style was such that there weren't any curtains that I could close. I just had to watch TV and live with the anxiety of knowing someone outside could be watching me and I would have no idea. One night I was sitting down in the living room and I thought I heard a noise, so I turned the volume on the TV down. Sure enough, what I heard was a slight tap, tap, tap. I looked around and didn't see anything out of place, so I assumed it was a noise from a tree or something outside. But every time I turned the volume back up, I heard that same tap, tap, tap. Finally, I turned the TV off altogether and started walking around the house. As my eyes adjusted to the darker room, I saw a man outside the window, fingernail pressed to the glass, making that tap, tap, tap noise and smiling at me. I freaked out and sprinted upstairs to check on the kid, but the worst part was that there wasn't a phone upstairs, so I eventually had to creep back downstairs to grab a phone and call the police. I tried to avoid looking at the window, but I snuck a glance, and he was still there, just watching me calmly. I locked myself and the kid into his bedroom and waited for the police. They never found any trace of someone around the house and I suspect that they thought that I was some kid playing a prank, but I know the person I saw was a full-grown man and that he just stood there enjoying the fear that he caused me to feel. I'm an 18-year-old guy who lives with his mom. We don't live in the house I grew up in, but we are in the same neighborhood as my grandma's house and only a minute away from all of my aunts and uncles and cousins. It's always been a nice and happy area for me because I grew up around here. To say it plainly, I love this place and I feel comfortable almost everywhere in this city. Nothing bad has happened to me or any of my family members while we've lived in this town. It's close to the Gulf of Mexico and it's full of chemical plants and thus workers from chemical plants and their families. Most people mind their own business and have a lot of respect for hard work and integrity, but there are some crazies living here. There was a body found in a storage unit not too long ago. It was a woman who was murdered by her husband. He wasn't charged because he committed suicide shortly after. A man who used to work at the same power plant I work at now was arrested for killing a woman with his car and then driving away. The point being, shit goes bad sometimes here, but most of the time it's all okay. That's why I think this event is still a little shocking to me. It was a typical Thursday. I woke up at 7 a.m., went to work, and got off at 4. I went home and did all the normal stuff that I usually do. I took a shower, played some video games, smoked a little weed, and then ate dinner. Pretty good evening so far. My mom's friend April came over and stayed for a couple of hours. She lives a block away and walked but didn't want to walk alone in the dark. My mom told me at about 9pm she was walking April back to her house and that it would only take a few minutes. I said alright, I'll see you when you get back. And then they left. No more than a minute later, I thought I heard tapping on my window, but it was so light and inconsistent that I still don't know if anyone was actually tapping on my window. I still felt a little paranoid, and so I turned on some music to distract myself. I turned it down a minute or two later when I thought I heard my back door open. 
It's very loud because of how old it is, and because of how we always keep the spare key in the lock, which jangles every time it's opened. I turned my music off and didn't make another noise for a minute. I didn't hear anything. I know someone opened it. I know someone was inside my house. I could feel it. But I didn't hear footsteps or a voice or anything. It was silent. I was kind of scared, but I quickly told myself to grab the knife I keep in my desk drawer and then felt dumb because of the possibility that I was just being paranoid. Better safe than sorry, I guess. Once again, it was silent for a while. I thought that if I acted like I had the upper hand over whoever was in the house, they would be intimidated or scared. So I stood up and walked out of my bedroom, knife in hand. I don't know why, but I whistled. Just one note. I took a few steps forward. I was about to turn the corner and the back door would be in view. I stopped again and whistled once more, still thinking I was big and tough. I was about to walk around the corner, and then I heard something that made my hair stand up. I heard someone whistle back to me, clearly coming from my living room. I was terrified. I peered around the corner, and no one was there. The door was closed, but unlocked. I don't know if I left it unlocked or not. I truly can't remember. My mom came home a few minutes later, and I didn't tell her. Because I don't know. It's just weird, and it doesn't make sense. I really don't know what to think about it. But someone whistled back to me. About five years ago, my husband Adam and I decided it was finally time to start looking to purchase a house. We had always talked about buying an old fixer-upper home because we've had the idea that they hold more charm and character. Plus, we can appreciate a place that has its own quirks and we love the thought of turning something run down into something beautiful again. With that being said, I grew up in a pretty rural farming town in Indiana that had more than its fair share of run-down houses. The surrounding areas had started to boom a little bit, with farmland being sold off and turned into new factory locations, along with new subdivisions for the people coming to work for them. I thought it would be a great place to start on our house hunt. I figured we would be a lot closer to civilization than I used to be growing up but not so much that we would be living a stone's throw away from our neighbors. Adam and I decided to take a drive one summer Sunday afternoon so I could show him some of the back roads of my hometown and to also see what some of the properties we checked out online looked like in person. As we were turning off the main road through town and further onto a more secluded country road, we noticed that the very first house on the left was completely abandoned. We pulled into a small patch of the yard where the grass was shortest and where a gravel driveway used to be to further investigate. It was painted a deep green color which made it almost invisible against the tall grass, sticker bushes, and weeds that had grown up around it. There was a massive tree in the front yard and the branches and leaves helped to camouflage this place even further. The house looked as if it were at least 100 years old. It looked like it had sat empty for years. It looked neglected, weather-worn, and in need of some major love. In that moment, it was perfect. There was nothing but woods across the street and no neighboring houses in sight. So Adam and I thought it probably wouldn't hurt if we just trespassed a little. I completely justified my reasoning by thinking, we're interested in buying this property, we're not here to cause trouble, we're doing someone a favor, we could take this burden of a house off of someone's hands, we just need to take a look around first, that's all. There wasn't any no trespassing signs anywhere, so I was perfectly armed with my newfound inflated ignorance and arrogance to assess the property. We walked carefully through the brush toward the left side of the house, where we noticed a well that was still standing, 
complete with a bucket, a rope, a handle, and the original overhang. My excitement for a picturesque country house was building. Directly across from the well, there was a side entrance into the house through what looked like an added-on mudroom. The screen door to the mudroom was closed, however there was a wooden door behind it that was half open. This was our not really intrusive because we aren't breaking anything to get in way of getting inside. It was probably in the mid 90s outside that day, so when we entered, Adam went first. We were met with thick, stifling heat. The kind that holds so much humidity that it almost takes your breath away. What we thought was a mudroom was an extended pantry area or canning kitchen. It was tiny with one window, an old rusted sink, a small stove, and the walls still held shelves of canned and spoiled vegetables. I remember thinking, oh yeah, this'll be great. I totally remember how to can, and we can have a garden. It also had the doorway into the main part of the house, and this is where my elation came to an end. Through the doorway was the kitchen. What remained of the cabinets and the sink were against the wall on the left, but they were either broken or hanging on for dear life or both. The kitchen connected to a wide open living area with one side having walls streaked with black that led up to a half sunken gray ceiling. There had been a fire at some point. The windows on that wall were filthy, covered in dust or ash that made the room much darker than it should have been in the middle of the day. My heart sank. I knew we wouldn't be able to afford a costly repair of a house fire, but I kept that disappointing thought to myself. The open living room area had not one stitch of furniture, save for one small wooden rocking horse that a child would have. The floor was littered with magazines, as if someone had a giant stack of them and just threw them in the air to see where they would land. Curious as to what the former homeowners liked in regards to reading material, I decided to check them out. Almost every single magazine was related to dolls in some way. Porcelain doll collecting, Barbie dolls, making dolls by hand, clothing for dolls. I felt a little creeped out by it, especially under the surveillance of the rocking horses dead, painted on stare but I figured that an old lady must have lived in the house before, and I created a self-medicating idea that her husband probably died, and this was the only hobby that she had to pass her time. We decided to check out another room that was connected to the half-burned living area. Through the doorway to the left was a weird combination of a molded, stand-up shower with handicap handles, and an assisted toilet next to it divided down the middle by a wall. On the right was a wall made entirely of built-in bookshelves. The shelves were full of paperwork, manila envelopes, books, and even more magazines. It struck us as a pretty weird setup, but thought these people must have really loved to read while sitting on the toilet. My husband and I thought we could find out who the previous homeowners were, since some of the paperwork on top of the stacks seemed to be old bills. If we wanted to look up property records, at least now we would have a name to go on. I grabbed a stack of papers and began to flip through them. When about halfway through, they changed from being old telephone bills to printed out color pictures from the internet of porcelain dolls. I put the stack of papers back on the shelf and picked up a small, red, five-star notebook. I started from the beginning, casually leafing through and seeing daily entries of medications taken, blood pressure and glucose measurements written in neat handwriting. About 20 pages in, the entries started to change entirely. They became crude drawings of twisted faces done in red ink. The faces had horns or bloody fangs. Then, full-on drawings of devils appeared in the pages after. I wanted to believe that a child had picked this up to doodle in, but I felt like this was something much different than that. After the drawings, the notebook became someone's personal journal, 
written in what I assumed was an elderly man's cursive handwriting. It told of how he knew he was coming toward the end of his life, and how he remembered being just a young boy when his mother passed away. He described in detail how the wake for his mother was held in the front room of this house, and how during those nights he crawled on top of his mother's body in her coffin to sleep. I couldn't believe what I was reading. Even though I had been sweating from the thickness in the air, a sudden rush of goosebumps came over me. I immediately showed it to Adam, flipping to the pages of devils and snarled faces, and then read aloud this stranger's memories of his mother just to see if it was the same the second time around. After I finished, he said, Well, this just got a whole lot weirder. While I was reading the notebook, he continued rifling through the mountains of papers. One stack not only had more printed pictures of dolls, but now they contained pictures of real women in torture bondage, ball gags or electrical tape placed over their mouths, jumper cables twisting on their nipples, being hogtied with rope. Sometimes there was more than one woman in the picture. It felt as if a brick had been tossed into my stomach. For some, those images wouldn't be disturbing, but in the context of our visit, my panic was starting to grow. I was torn between wanting to find out more and getting the hell out of this house. Adam reassured me that while it was on the creepy side, it wasn't anything to necessarily lose my shit over since the women didn't seem to be suffering or bleeding. The burned out living area was separated from the rest of the house by a staircase. The staircase had a room directly across from it, and a small hallway on the other side that led to the main room at the front of the house. We debated on going up to the second floor, but decided against it since it already felt as if we were roasting in an oven and were unsure of the stability of this second story. Going into the room across the staircase, we noticed a few more doll magazines on the floor, but not near the number as the other rooms held. There were scattered plastic doll pieces here and there, random arms and heads. To the left was the original fireplace with a couple tiny vases on the mantel. Smack dab in the middle was a framed picture of an elderly couple, smiling and happy. These certainly weren't the type of people that would have pictures of women bound and gagged, hidden away in their bathroom. These people could have been my grandparents, I thought to myself. To the right was a big bay window, and smack dab in the middle was a yellowed piece of paper with faded black printed handwriting on it. It was for anyone on the outside of the house to see. Reading it backwards from inside, it said, If you're here to talk about Jesus, go away. That's kind of funny, Adam said after reading it for himself. Yeah, it kind of is, I half chuckled. But something in my brain was now starting to nag me even more. Something wasn't computing correctly for me. Thinking back, my mind was putting together that an elderly couple in this town would more than likely be pretty religious, and by the super small chance that they weren't, it would have been gossiped about had someone seen that in the window. It was as if the house had held two very different personalities within. I told my husband that I just wanted to go into one last room down the little hallway, and then I would be very ready to leave. Going down the small hallway, it became darker and cooler. It was a relief from the oppressive heat that we had been dealing with since we first stepped inside. The shade from the giant tree in the front yard had blocked out a lot of the sunlight, making it about 20 degrees cooler. But we soon realized that wasn't the only reason this part of the house's temperature was much more tolerable. Rounding the corner into the last room, it took a few seconds for our eyes to adjust to the difference in light, but the change of the air was noticeable immediately. It was as if we had stepped into a cave. The smell was dank and left a dampness on our skin. Once things came into clear focus, that's when we saw it. The main reason our senses had shifted so quickly, the large hole in the floor. 
At first, we thought that perhaps the wooden floor was so weak that it had simply caved in on its own, or that the roof had leaked and caused this exact area of the floor to rot away, but not upon getting closer it became obvious this wasn't the case. The hole was about five feet across and went straight down into the earth, with about two feet of space between the remaining floor and dirt. This hole was there because it was made to be there. My husband and I looked at each other. My heart was racing so fast that I thought it would burst through my chest. I said aloud to him while pointing, What the hell is this? Why is this here? I panicked, my breathing becoming more rapid and shallow. Nothing was making sense, and yet, the thoughts that had been running in the background of my brain were all coming together like a jigsaw puzzle. And then we saw them, a few old and molded over driver's licenses, just thrown around haphazardly, checkbooks, credit cards, as if someone had emptied their purse or wallet in this room and then just disappeared into this hole. I was overcome with terror and dread. I had to get out of this house. My skin felt like static, as if my whole body had been taken over by the sensation of when your foot falls asleep. I had tears forming in my eyes, and my mind just told me to run. Without having to speak, Adam quickly took me by the arm and led us back down the hallway, through the burned out living room and kitchen, out the side canning room and back out into the light of day. We ran back down the mangled and tangled driveway to the car. Remembering back on it, I get the eerie feeling that we weren't the only two people in the house that day. We drove past it about a year later, and the large tree in the front yard had all its branches removed. All of the windows had been boarded shut, and after doing some research, we found out that the land it sits on is for sale. The house itself has been condemned. Our old house was on a corner, and in lieu of a backyard, had a side yard with a small deck that wrapped around the back. The dining room had patio doors that led out to the back, and we would have barbecues and such back there. When I was about 14 years old, we only had one desktop computer and one laptop for the family. My brother and I would fight over the desktop, because that's where Diablo 2 was installed so I would use the laptop to write music. On one particular night, my brother had a friend over, and they were downstairs doing whatever, and I was on the dining room table on the laptop. As I was wrapped up in my writing, I didn't pay much attention to my surroundings. I heard a knock on the patio door, which startled me. I looked up, expecting my brother or his friend to be standing there, but standing at the door and waving, was a person wearing a Halloween pig mask. Thinking it was my brother or his friend, I mouthed, good one, and gave the person the finger, and they walked away. As soon as they left, I went downstairs to give them shit, and to my surprise and dismay, they were both sitting on the couch playing PlayStation. They swore up and down it wasn't either of them and there was no way one of them would have had the time to get downstairs and take the mask off before getting on the couch. To this day, I have no idea who it was that knocked and waved. I went to my mom's house in the middle of the day to pick up a sweater that I had left there a few days earlier. She was at work, but I often popped in to pick up something or leave her some vegetables from my garden while she was at work. When I walked in the door, there was an elderly man sitting at her breakfast table. He looked up and smiled at me, and I assumed my mother was home from work that day and entertaining a neighbor for breakfast. I smiled politely and said hello and explained I was just grabbing a sweater. I then walked out the door and sent a text to my mom on my way to work saying that I'm sorry to have missed her and that I interrupted her breakfast company. She called me back freaking out. 
because she was at work and had no idea who was in her house. In college, I worked at our campus library and I had often been the one to shut it down at night, where I'd have to go around and clear work tables and anything that students had left behind and leave any books that needed to be put away stacked neatly on a cart for the morning workers. It was pretty creepy being there alone at night, but in a way, I still felt pretty safe since the campus was enclosed and you had to go through a security checkpoint to get inside after dusk. One night, I was there alone shutting everything down and I just had a creepy feeling that someone was watching me. I knew I was alone because before anyone is left alone, whoever else is working at night locks the doors and does a check to make sure that no stragglers are still in the building, and then the closer cleans up and locks the door again from the outside. This night, everywhere I went, I kept looking around. I was sure that someone was in there following me. Finally, I finished everything up and I went to clock out when I noticed one of the staff computers near the front door was lit up as if someone had used it recently. I went over and looked at the monitor and saw a Word document pulled up that followed through everything I had been doing since my coworker had left earlier that night. It read something like, 12 o'clock, alone, I see you, 12.05, group study rooms, I see you. 1207. Stacks. I see you. 1211. Media Center. I see you. 1215. Reference Tables. I see you. The scariest part was that I looked over to the door and it was still locked, meaning whoever had typed this was still in the library with me. I left my stuff where it was and left immediately, locking the door from the outside. By the time I got to another building and got campus security and went back to the library, the door was unlocked and whoever was in there had left. When I was a kid, my mom wanted me to go to the elderly couple that lived next door and see if we could borrow a few eggs from them so that she didn't have to go to the store. I knocked on their front door, but they didn't answer. I could see the old man standing in the living room through the window. I knocked louder on the door, but he didn't turn around. I thought maybe he just couldn't hear me because he was very old. So I turned the doorknob and it was unlocked. I walked in calling out for him. It was so strange to me that he wouldn't turn around until I got in the living room and saw that he wasn't standing there. He had hung himself and I had been trying to get the attention of a hanging corpse for the last 10 minutes. I always check the blinds before I go outside. For years, people have made fun of me while they witness this, and my husband thinks I'm crazy. We live out in the country, and we've never had an issue with someone trespassing, but I still lean over every time I'm going out the front door and make sure no one's out there first. One night, I was about to go to bed when I realized I left my phone charger in my car. I had put it in my purse that morning because the one I had at work broke and only just remembered it as I left, placing it on my passenger seat. I needed to charge my phone and I didn't have a reason to be afraid of the 10 yards from my front door to my car parked in the driveway, but I peeked out the window anyway. I was running on such instinct that my hand was already on the lock, about to flip it and open the door when my brain registered that what I had seen wasn't normal. I shifted my weight back and looked again, squinting to see in the dim light by the garage we leave on all the time. I saw a man crouched down by the front door, holding a hammer. 
He wouldn't be visible from the little window on the front door. You wouldn't even see him until he was right next to you. I screamed for my husband and watched him book it down the driveway. I didn't see him get into a car, but he must have gone somewhere. We called the cops and they couldn't find any sign of him. We invested in some floodlights the next day, and no one made fun of my habit again. In 2010, I was 20 years old and had just moved back home to Massachusetts after transferring from a school in North Carolina. My best friend June's roommate was conveniently moving out of their apartment, so I took over the lease. It was a tiny apartment on the second floor. There were four apartments chiseled out of an old, large house, and the building was set back from a moderately busy intersection in a college area. Still, it was my hometown. The landlord used to be the mayor. I hadn't yet met any of the other occupants or neighbors, but that really hadn't even occurred to me. I felt perfectly safe in this apartment. I was home alone one night, a couple days after moving in. I had just gotten in, and I was unloading dishes in the kitchen, across the apartment from the front door, which was the only door. There was a knock. June worked in the neighborhood and liked to hang out at a nearby coffee shop, and we had a few friends who lived a few streets over. She walked everywhere, and it wouldn't have surprised me if she had just stopped by for a minute and left her keys inside. And because of this, I didn't really think twice about swinging open the door. A stranger stood on my doorstep. He was well-dressed, clean-shaven, and smiling. He looked completely normal. This was before I grew older and more jaded, so I took him at his word when he started talking. He said that he was a neighbor and he had locked himself out of his apartment. He introduced himself and mentioned people's names. I assumed these were other neighbors. He asked if he could borrow a phone to call his wife. I said sure, and with him still standing in the doorway, I turned to grab my phone from the coffee table. I had my back to him for less than 10 seconds while he came inside, sat on a chair right by the door and shut the door behind him. When I turned back around and saw him, I was shocked. He reached his hand out for my phone and like the shocked idiot I was, I instinctively handed it to him. Instead of hanging on to my lifeline, I handed it to some strange man sitting uninvited in my living room. I immediately began kicking myself and started to look around for things to use as a weapon. There was nothing except a small ceramic bunny sitting on top of the TV. While I was fruitlessly scanning for a weapon, he was calling his wife. He called her three times but she wasn't picking up. After he hung up the phone, he asked if I could give him a ride somewhere. Since he had locked his keys in his apartment, he obviously couldn't drive himself. Immediately, I sprung into action, lying my ass off. Oh, well, my boyfriend borrowed my car to go to work, but he should definitely be home by now. He actually just lives up the street, so we can walk there now. I'll call and let him know that we're coming. I was petrified, but I somehow sold the story. Even though I was lying through my teeth, he reacted instantly in just how I wanted him to. Oh no, that's okay don't want to bother you. Thanks anyways. He stood up in a hurry, handing me my phone back. Have a good night. After he left, I had locked the doors behind him and calmed down a bit. I thought maybe I had been overreacting. Maybe he was just a severely nervous or socially awkward guy who really was locked out of his apartment. Maybe I was being too harsh in my assessment of him but I couldn't let it go. This nagging feeling that something was not right, that I really had been in danger. I wanted to know for sure, so I decided to redial his wife's phone number. Instead of a voicemail, there was an error message stating that the number didn't exist. He wasn't calling anyone. I never saw him again, but he obviously wasn't one of my neighbors.
I was trying to make friends in my new city, so I went to a party a co-worker invited me to. I ended up having too much to drink because I was trying to calm my nerves and have fun with strangers. Uber wasn't a thing yet, so I decided I would just sleep it off in my car and drive home in the morning. I woke up in the dead of the night and the city street was eerie. It had been well populated when I had passed out, but now it was deserted. I could see by the light of some street lights and the glow of the moon. I wondered for a minute what had woken me up before I heard a scratching noise on the passenger side rear window. I'll never forget the look on the guy's face who was crouched outside my car, staring at me and trying to get my attention. When he saw me, he grinned and pressed his open mouth against the glass and then made a chomping motion with his teeth barred and giggled wildly. The worst part was that there was nothing I could do. I knew I didn't want to risk driving drunk, but I didn't want to get out of the car and run away either. In the end, I took my jacket off and put it over my face and just tried to go back to sleep knowing that he was still there. I heard him walking around the car tapping at the glass for what felt like hours as I hid in plain sight and prayed for him to go away. I used to live in a very beautiful but very rural community in Appalachia. I grew up there and it felt safe to me so going on night hikes with my girlfriend was a normal thing. I had a gun back in my trunk, but I didn't bring it with me because my only concern was bears and they weren't around that area. We had gone on this hike many nights before when the sky was clear and it wasn't that dark out, but for some reason we both felt uneasy on this night. I kept hearing a little voice in my head saying, turn back. When we were about three quarters of the way to our usual summit, I couldn't take it anymore, and I told her I thought we should turn around and go back to the car. Later, she would tell me that she had been feeling apprehensive all night too. She was as eager as I was to get the hell out of there. No sooner had we turned when we heard a blood-curdling scream in the middle of the dark. A second scream broke out in another location, and then a third, then a fourth and then a fifth. All around us we could hear people hidden in the woods, only a few feet away, screaming at the top of their lungs in the dark. We ran out of there as fast as we could, totally full of adrenaline. I scoured the local paper that entire summer, looking for anything that would have made sense of what we experienced, but no one reported anything weird happening in those woods that summer. On a road trip with my girlfriend, I realized I was too tired to keep driving, and I ended up pulling off the road so we could nap for a few hours before going the rest of the way. I dozed off and woke up a bit later to a scratching sound coming from what seemed like the trunk area of my car. My girlfriend woke up and asked me what I was doing, and then her eyes got really wide. She heard the scratching too. I whispered to her that it was probably a wild animal but I wasn't convinced. The scratching sounded more intentional, as if it was meant to scare us. We sat there for a few minutes praying that the noise would just go away, and then we decided to screw it and started the car up. We didn't need to sit there and be scared. As we drove away, we both looked out the windows to see if anything unusual was behind the car, but we just saw an empty road. We got to our destination and parked the car in the hotel parking lot. We got out of the car and went to the trunk to grab our bags when we saw someone had keyed. I can see you into the paint on the trunk. I grew up just north of New York City, 
living in a pretty densely populated metropolitan area. I always look forward to the summer when my father and I went backpacking upstate. We had a spot about an hour north of Lake Georgia and the Andradax and camped a few nights there every summer. One trip, a few years back now, we were driving to the trailhead on a long, narrow dirt road. Now we saw a car pull over with a few people arguing outside. This isn't exactly the most secluded spot in the world, so it's not uncommon to see another family. But it was weird that a car decided to pull over here, with no real access to any trails. As we drove closer, a man walked over and waved at us. We assumed that they were having problems with their car. My father rolled down his window. Suddenly, a female in the group screamed, Get away from him! The man then had a very serious expression on his face and began sprinting towards us. He was tall and well built and moved very quick. My father slammed on his brakes, quickly pulling the car into reverse. The man stopped, let out a very loud sigh. We just sat there, parked, confused. The man reached towards us. We were a good 10 or so yards away, but then he darted off into the road into the woods. Cautiously at this point, we drove slowly to park the car. There were three women there, crying. They were his sisters, and apparently, he just returned home from the army a few months prior. According to them, shortly after he got back, he began to act odd. He was diagnosed with PTSD as well as an early onset of Alzheimer's disease. The women got back in their car and headed for town. They said they were going to the ranger station and going to try and find him. The rest of the day was fairly uneventful. We hiked to our campsite and fished for a bit, set up the camp for the night. Sitting next to the fire, my father and I felt some weird vibes. We weren't sure whether the women were lying or not, and if the man was trying to ask for our help. What was more disturbing was the fact that we were camping only a few miles away from where this guy ran off. We weren't sure if he was armed, violent, or followed us. Now typically, my father and I would sleep in separate bivvy tents, but we decided to stay in the shelter that night. It was basically a small log cabin with three walls and an open front. That's where the fire pit is. Neither of us slept that night. It was probably just my imagination, but I swear I was being watched. Now through my father, I didn't hear the footsteps or anything out of the ordinary. The next day, I woke up and went to use a bathroom. A few hundred feet away from my camp, I saw a small fire pit right on the trowel. I placed my hands on the ashes. They were soaked. Somebody had a fire here very recently and poured it out. We had food supplies for four nights, but after I found the fire pit, we broke camp and left that evening. Back in ninth grade, I had unwillingly befriended somebody I really wanted to avoid. Let me start off with some background information. I don't know if it's like this for all schools, but basically, we're assigned a school based on what zone we lived in. During my middle school years, we moved and I was supposed to change schools, but I was given the chance to stay as long as I went to the proper high school later. Now I tried out for these specific scientific classes and made it in. One of the big things for this class was team building, so it was pretty much tradition that every year there was a mini camping trip to get to know our peers. I remembered very well that everybody had already known each other since they'd come from the same high school. When the trip day arrived, my classmates scrambled onto the bus and I hung back. By the time I worked up the courage to enter, 
there was only one more seat available. Everyone avoided it. Looking back now, I realised it is because of him. I sat down, and there was a boy, short and thin, totally non-threatening. He seemed relieved that somebody had sat next to him for a while, but he didn't say anything. An hour later, he finally decided to try and talk to me. It was small talk, slightly forced on my end, simply because talking to new people makes me uncomfortable. Now after a while of this, I eventually fell asleep, and I woke up to him leaning on me. I pushed him off and nothing more was said. Sometime later we got off and went to camp. I began to notice that he'd follow me. If I did any camp activities, he was by my side at all times. It was difficult for me to make friends with this weird guy following me everywhere. I finally had connected with a few other girls though and stuck mostly by them. One event that struck me as odd though was when we went swimming in the lake. We wanted to go into the shower afterwards, but he wanted to join us. We told him not to and as we walked, he trailed behind us. We actually began pleading for him to just go away. It took a teacher to catch up on our conversation to make him leave. Now after this trip, there were a few things that stuck out from his creepy mannerisms. He clung to our group of girls and despite our annoyance, we didn't want to be cruel and send somebody away that was clearly mentally ill. I remembered one time I was inviting them over for a sleepover and he was angry that he wasn't allowed to come, stating that I was sexist. In fact, whenever I showed any interest to any other person, he would purposely ruin anything. He was heavily jealous of my brother. Now there was one event that was really the last straw. It was morning time before classes started, so I waited in the cafeteria with some friends. He came up to me with a lot of purpose in his step and asked me to come with him somewhere. I didn't know where, but I didn't want to go and flat out refused. His response? He marched around the table for seven minutes, no pauses, nothing. It literally took another student to tell him to leave me alone. That student then told me that he had done it to her before. I was shocked honestly. She told me that it would only get worse if we didn't stop him in his tracks, so that's what I had to do. I told him to leave me alone, and if he didn't, I was going to report him for harassment. It wasn't over though. I don't recall any creepy behaviour happening in 10th grade, but then this year marched in. I was kicked out of the special science class and placed in CP Algebra 2 class. I walked in and who do I see? Him. He stares at me and smiles. I sat down a couple of rows away from him. Now the first week passes with no problems. He interjects in class a lot and corrects the teacher but nothing to me. Then I heard him talking to himself whispering. Now when he got called out by a student for doing so, they joked about it and all was well it seemed. He said nothing else audible to me. And then he got a bit louder, intending for me to hear it. That he was going to get his revenge on the people that wronged him and a sinister smile come across his face. Now eventually he got suspended and I moved out of the maths class straight away. I don't know what revenge he had planned for me or whatever come of him, I just hope that he never got his revenge and never hurt anyone. When I was seven, I was camping with my parents and baby sister in Virginia. We were staying in a campground specifically for RVs, but there were also some cabins available to rent. On the first day there, after being constantly protested to let me take the park, my dad complained to my mum that I was old enough to walk the short distance to the park and play without their supervision. My mum has always been very overprotective and a true warrior even more so after this camping trip. My mum finally gave in and allowed me to go alone to the campground park. While at the playground, I met a little girl around my own age. We played together for a while. She was also by herself. I invited her to come back to my RV 
to play with bar beers with me, and we headed in that direction. On the way, we crossed paths with my parents, who were going to another family's RV to visit and socialize. We let them know that we were going to play Barbies in my family's RV. After we played for a little while, she suggested we pick up the Barbies and go to the cabin she and her grandparents were staying in to play with the Barbies too, which we did. It never occurred to me that my parents didn't know this girl or her family or where I would have gone. They had assumed that we were going to stay in the RV and play. Now we played at her cabin for a long time. While we played, her grandparents were packing up their things, preparing to leave the campground. When they were all packed up to go, they said that they would back off at my RV on their way so I wouldn't have to walk. Obviously, my parents had always told me to never, ever get in the car with a stranger. I knew this, but it just never occurred to me that this was exactly what they meant by that. I mean, genuinely, I never felt afraid or concerned even in the slightest about this situation. The little girl's grandparents packed up their car. All of us climbed in. We stopped at the campground's general store. Her grandpa then got both of us some ice cream. And all I could think of was how this was so kind and generous. We then got back in the car. I assumed that they would be next to drop me off in the RV. I stayed in the car eating ice cream and talking with my friend, completely oblivious to the outside world of the car. Suddenly, my dad flew open the door with tears pouring down his cheeks. He yanked me out of the car and hugged me so hard that I thought I was going to pass out. I was just confused. Then, the car I was in sped away. Very quickly, it was then that I realised that we were at the exit of the campground. Apparently, upon returning to our RV and finding my new friend and me gone without a trace, my parents had contacted the ranger station and a lot of people went out to find me. They actually went from door to door of different RVs. My dad just happened to be walking by when he saw me in another person's car, just about to leave the campground. I don't know who those people were, but they definitely had no intention of bringing me back to my parents. I think the ice cream was brought there to distract me. Over the years, I've often thought of that day and just how differently my life would have been now if it was not for my dad and had he not seen me just in the nick of time. Just a little background information. I'm a 26 year old female, kind of a tomboy. I grew up climbing trees, playing in the dirt. I've never touched a Barbie doll in my life. So back in the summer of 2002, I was 16 at the time. My boyfriend asked me on a camping trip with him and his parents. Me being the tomboy that I was, I graciously accepted. His parents were planning on a weekend of us going out rafting, boating, swimming, the works. I was in paradise. Now they had an RV, it was fully furnished and I slept in the kitchen and living room area. So as a side note, we're out in the middle of the woods, a designated camping area. It was so quiet and peaceful. You could hear the river in the stillness of the night. It was soothing. I remembered thinking to myself, I could live here forever. The next day was probably the funnest day of my life. We went out kayaking, swam, and then my boyfriend's dad had a cookout. I can't remember the last time that I laughed so much and enjoyed myself so much. It seemed like the day flew by, but before I knew it, it was time for us to go to bed. We had a big day planned for the next day, and I was eager to get enough sleep so I could wake up and do it all over again. 
I remembered lying awake, though, just staring at the ceiling. My boyfriend was snoring, and I laughed as quietly as I could. He snored very loud. This was the one last laugh that I got before my life was literally changed forever. There was a tap on the side of the RV. It caught me off guard. I wasn't even alarmed. I just thought it as a random noise. You know the ones. A creak here and there. Just unsettling. Bottom line is, I wasn't scared or freaked out by it too much. I tried to sleep, but I heard another tap then an unmistakable giggle. I thought maybe my boyfriend's parents were awake and messing around with us. Silence washed over the place again. I hear the river, the ringing in my ears that you get when it's dead silence. I had this sinking feeling in my stomach. I hear people say they get it when something bad's about to happen. I felt it at that moment. In the dead silence, I hear the giggle again followed by a scraping sound coming from outside of the RV. My heart jumped into my throat and I felt tears in my eyes. Somebody's outside the RV, but I was literally scared stiff. I could not move a muscle and the scraping sound continued. I whispered for my boyfriend but he kept on snoring. I was lying about five feet away from the main door. More silence. My heart is beating so fast that I'm afraid I'm going to have a heart attack. I tap my chest trying to calm myself. As I'm watching the square hole in the door, I see a small hand just appear out of the darkness. I almost shriek out in fear. The hand was of a girl, no doubt. I could see those fake fresh ones that you get from Walmart. But that still didn't stop me from freaking out. I sit up and start screaming. I mean really start wailing. My boyfriend's parents stagger into the room, all I can do is point at the door. My boyfriend's dad goes to open the door, but there's a sudden crash. He then falls back inside, falling onto the couch, out cold. A rock falls onto the floor. That's when my boyfriend wakes up and starts shouting. The mum is going insane, tending to her husband. I'm screaming, still in shock. When I stop screaming, I hear hysterical laughter from outside, followed by footsteps on top of the RV. We're on the roof. We're on the roof. I hear in a high-pitched, nasally voice from outside the RV. None of us have cell phones. It's 2002. And we were just now starting to get into the cell phone craze. So we're truly magically out in the middle of nowhere with no way to get help. The RV is rocking with somebody jumping up and down. Then there's a crash and the side door frame smashes in. The girl outside is screaming and laughing. She mocks me. The dad manages to sober up and grab a gun from one of the cupboards. He opens the door and fires out into the darkness. The pacing on the roof immediately stops. The shrieking girl outside suddenly stops too. Everything goes silent. I turn to look at my boyfriend. There's a window behind him. I see a face, a hood drawn over his face. I know it's a man because I can make the outline of a beard on him. That was all I could see. The man then raises a gloved hand and starts waving at me. I pull my boyfriend away from the window and start screaming. The dad runs inside asking what's wrong. I look back at the window, the man is gone. We drove out to the campsite that night with a broken window. My boyfriend's dad went to hospital with a minor concussion, where the rock hit him. The parents called the police the next morning, and the officers went out and searched the area. They couldn't find anything. No other reports were even filed after. I had to go through counselling and therapy, because I had trouble sleeping for about two years after it. My boyfriend and I actually broke up due to the stress and trauma I was going through because of it, actually. Eventually, I started to get better then. While I was in university, some girlfriend and I decided to go to the movies. There was one out called The Strangers. I decided to go back because I had no homework. Turns out, it was scarily like the experience I had though. I actually had a panic attack because of this and had to go hospital. A few months after that, 
I've read a newspaper article where a woman was arrested at a campsite not too far away from where my boyfriend's parents' RV was vandalised, and they were arrested for vandalising some tents and RVs. I don't know if it is the same girl though. They didn't show her face or picture, but it did make me wonder. As of 2012, I no longer go to therapy or have nightmares, but I do own several types of guns. If you knock on my door in the middle of the night, you better have an explanation as to why you're doing so. So last summer, I booked a glamping trip in the next county over. The website looked beautiful. A campsite of six large yurts outside a lovely little village. Coincidentally, I had driven through that village before, as it's close to a really historical castle I like to visit on the odd occasion. So we pay our money. My husband, two kids and I pitch up. It's one of the last weekends of the summer. It was lovely weather. The campsite's on a small hill, and the people who owned it lived on top of the hill in their farmhouse. We were checking in on a Sunday for two nights, as we were shift workers at the time. We passed other people checking out, they all seemed to be happy. The owners of the site showed us down to the yurt, and mentioned that we were the only ones supposed to be there. We were happy with that to be honest, because with two young kids, it meant that they could make a lot of noise if they wanted, and they wouldn't disturb anybody. When she showed us around, she did say that the yurt door didn't lock, none of them did, which okay, fine because you don't lock a tent, right? The place was in its own mini wooded area, it was absolutely gorgeous. The owner also mentioned the kids would be safe to wander because they had primitive fences because of their dogs. The first night was fun, we had a barbecue, the kids played and then went to bed at about 8. I found it hard to sleep, but I often do whenever I'm somewhere new. There was also patched phone coverage so we just read until we went to sleep. The next morning, my husband seemed a bit out of sorts. I said to him if he was okay, and he said, yep, I'm fine, so I left it. We went out for the day and had a great time. The whole day was blazing hot, and then we got back. It was washing up after dinner and the kids were playing and a shadow come over the whole place. I felt eyes on me. It went really cold. Honestly, it felt like something bad was gonna happen. I felt dread hit me. We already paid to stay, but I pulled my husband to one side and said, we're gonna leave now. I don't know why, but I've got a really bad feeling. Please, just go home, come on. Normally, he'd try and talk me out of things like this, but he didn't. He started getting the kids together, and I packed our stuff. We went to the farmhouse where the couple who owned it were sat outside playing with their dogs. My husband started loading up the car, while I apologised to them and explained that we needed to leave because our youngest wasn't well. They then said how sorry they were about it. Then, just as I turned to leave, the man owner said to my husband, had he been outside last night at about 3 or 4 in the morning? I said no, he hadn't left my side the whole time. I would have woken. He said to me, are you sure? By this point, my husband was next to me and said no. Why is that? Well, says the guy, the security lights come on and the dog started barking. And when we looked outside, there was a man wandering around. 
who then turned around and walked back down the directions of the yurts. They assumed it was my husband. We both said it wasn't. We said our goodbyes quickly. I tore out of that place in the car. And then, about a quarter mile down the road, my husband turned to me and said, You're right. I was quiet this morning. I didn't say anything because I thought you'd make fun of me. I went to use a bathroom in the wee hours, but as I was about to get up, I heard footsteps on the decking outside. Not hooves or something. Somebody on two legs. I just laid there, as quiet as I possibly could be, hoping that the kids wouldn't wake up. This experience still gives me chills to this day. I've actually had a few other camp encounters that I can share here if anybody's interested. But anyway, a few years ago, I worked at a Jewish summer camp in North Georgia. As many of you may know, Georgia is a fairly conservative state, as well as being predominantly Christian. There are small Jewish communities and a few summer camps. I'd say this camp was more culturally Jewish than it was religious. I mean, there were no religious requirements for non-religion Pacific focus. Rather, it was a place for kids who were often in the minor tree to come to camp for a while. Staff would actually come from all over the world. Lots of Australians, lots of British people, and a few Israelis, and people from various areas of the USA. Each night at around 10, most of the staff were able to get out of town for a couple of hours. Enough staff remained behind to watch over the cabins though, we did a rotation. This particular night, a group of about five of us decided to go to a local bar to grab a few beers. It had been a hot day and was humid at night, so we decided to sit outside on the patio. For some backstory on the town, generally, we were extremely well received by the community despite our differences. We brought in lots of revenue for the town during summer. We bought supplies at the local Walmart and often took campers onto tubing trips or occasionally out to dinner or for a long hike on the Appalachian Trail. It was midsummer, so we'd been out to the bars in many areas. So five of us sat around a table, drinking and discussing the events of the day, as fellow employees typically would do after work. About 30 minutes in, a white man in his 20s come up to our table. I distinctly remembered a jagged scar on his cheek, but I didn't think too much of it. He introduces himself, then told us that he was having a party that night at his place. Anyone can come, he said. Black, white, gay, straight. I found it pretty odd that he had opened his speech with that disclaimer, of course. The party should be open to everyone, why did he have to put that disclaimer at the start? But, we'd all had a few beers and were feeling pretty loose. He talked for a bit longer, nothing seemed really off. We told him that we were working at the camp in the area and couldn't stay out, so we'd probably be heading back soon. An hour later, a group went out to the parking lot to get into the cars. As we approached, we saw the same guy come out of the shadows. He had a buddy with him this time with a shaved head. His expression was incredibly hateful. His eyes had changed. He pounded his fist into his hand. He took his shirt off and revealed a poorly inked SS tattoo. My stomach dropped. One of the bigger guys in my group, Calvin, immediately reacted by pulling out a knife from his back pocket and asked what he wanted. The original guy started shouting some anti-semitic remarks and told us that he was going to beat us down. Kevin started walking towards the two guys but we pulled him back. He told us his buddies were on the way. Sure enough, some more guys started walking into the parking lot. It's all kind of blurry here. I remember jumping into one of the cars, pulling Calvin with us. It felt like we were surrounded, though there was probably only seven or eight of them. Rocks were thrown at the car. We sped off. My heart was pounding like crazy. 
we never went back to that bar again.